In this video, I want to talk about what actually random effects estimation is and how does it work. And in order to do that, we're going to use the same example which we've been using in the last few videos, which is investigating the various factors which influence a house price in a given city I at a time period T. And we said that that might depend on the crime rate in that particular city at that point in time and the unemployment. And as well as these factors, there are also some unobserved factors which are contained within alpha i, if they're specific to that particular city, but don't vary across time. And as well as having some idiosyncratic factors which are contained within this UI term, a UIT term here rather. So the assumption under random effects is we assume that the covariance of alpha i with any of the independent variables, x, i, t, as I've written them here, is equal to zero. And we spoke about how in these examples, the random effects estimator is a better estimator than first differences, or as it turned out, fixed effects estimation. Uh, and also it was better than called OLS. And random effects estimation, as we spoke about, was a type of feasible generalized least squares estimator because essentially what we were doing is we were correcting for the presence of serial correlation. Okay, so what exactly is random effects estimation? Well, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to write down what the transformed equation is for the case of the random effects estimator. So the random effects estimator is when we take our dependent variable, house price in city i at time t, and then we take off some amount lambda times the time mean of the house price in that particular city i. And doing the same to the right hand side, we just have beta naught times one minus lambda. Then we have plus beta one, open brackets, the crime rate at into the i at time t minus lambda times the time mean of the crime rate in that particular city. And then we have plus beta 2 times the unemployment rate in that particular city at that point in time minus lambda times the unemployment rate in that particular city averaged over all time. And if we call this particular error term here eta it, we can just write that this error term here is going to be eta i t minus lambda times eta i. And I put a bar over the eta here to indicate that this is actually a time mean of this particular error. Okay, so bearing in mind that we don't know what this particular lambda is, we can already make some sort of comments on this particular transform system. Specifically, if lambda is equal to zero, then we're essentially we're going to recover this original system we had. So if lambda equals zero, we just uncover the original uh, equation which we had up there, and we're just estimating called OLS on that particular equation. So when lambda equals zero, random effects estimation is actually equivalent to just ordinary least squares when we pull all the observations together, because I should. I should mention that random effects is just estimating this transform system via pooled OLS. Okay, and similarly, we should note that if lambda equals one, then this random effects transform system is actually exactly equivalent to the fixed effects estimator. To, to see that, just imagine replacing lambda with just one, and it shouldn't take you too much time to notice that this is exactly the same as what we had in the fixed effects estimator example. Uh, if you're not immediately clear of that, then you should go back and have a look at the fixed effects video. Typically, however, lambda is between naught and one. So in the circumstance where lambda isn't zero and lambda, sorry, lambda is greater than zero and less than one, we have the random effects is not equivalent to either just called OLS or fixed effects estimation. So it's those particular examples that which we normally talk about when we talk about using random effects estimation. So what is this mysterious parameter lambda? Well lambda as it turns out is equal to 1 minus sigma mu squared all divided through by sigma mu squared plus 
t times sigma alpha all squared, all to the power half. Okay, so what do all these things mean in our expression for lambda? Well, sigma mu is just the variance of our idiosyncratic error term here. Sigma alpha squared is the variance of our unobserved term alpha i. Now that we have this expression for lambda, what we can do is we can talk about the circumstances under which lambda collapse, collapses to be equal to zero or equal to one. If it's equal to zero, we know that random effects is equivalent to OLS. And if lambda is equal to one, we know that random effects is equivalent to fixed effects. So how could we get lambda being equal to zero? Well, to see this, notice that if this term on the denominator, which contains sigma alpha squared, was removed from the denominator, then what we'd be left with is we'd be left with sigma mu squared divided by sigma mu squared, which is just one, and then taking it the square root of that, we just get one, so we'd get one minus one, which is equal to zero. So if we have sigma alpha squared being equal to zero, that implies that lambda is gonna be equal to zero. And in that circumstance, we know that random effects is equivalent to ordinary least squares or pooled OLS. And that shouldn't surprise us because essentially what we're saying is that this effect alpha i up here is unimportant. So what we can do is we can actually forget about alpha i and just estimate the above equation via OLS without having to worry about the issue of serially correlated errors. How would we get lambda is equal to one? Well, we get lambda being equal to one if it was the case that t times sigma alpha squared tended to infinity. And to see that that would create lambda equal to one, essentially what we'd be doing is this denominator would be getting very, very large. And hence when we divide any sort of number by a very, very large and practically infinite denominator, this whole second term is gonna disappear and we're just gonna get lambda being equal to one. And we know that lambda being equal to one implies that random effects is equivalent to fixed effects. And again, this shouldn't really surprise us because essentially if sigma alpha squared gets really, really big, then what random effects tries to do is it tries to remove as much of this effect as possible because if alpha is getting really, really big, then we probably shouldn't be using a random effects model in the first place. What we should be doing is using a fixed effects model. So fixed, so random effects in this circumstance, what it tries to do is it tries to remove as much of this alpha i as possible by creating lambda being equal to one. In practice, as I've said before, lambda typically lies between naught and one. So essentially the random effects system, which is this system here, is what we call a quasi-time domain system. It's quasi-time domain because we've taken off some fraction of the time domain values off the original values. It's not fully time domain unless lambda equals one. 